thank you. Uh, so as Lars said, I'm here today to talk about type classes, um, but more specifically, I want to talk about type class infrastructure, um, language infrastructure that lets us build libraries made up of type classes um, and uh, do so in a way that's a little more efficient than maybe what's provided by uh, Scala uh, out of the box. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Mike Pilquist. I am the primary author of S Codec and Simulacrum. I'll be talking about Simulacrum today. Um, contributor to a bunch of type level projects um, like CATS, uh, FS2, some others. Um, I work at a joint venture called CCAD. Uh, we're a small company based here in, in Philadelphia and in San Diego. Um, but we're a joint venture between Comcast and Aris Group. We build control systems for digital set-top boxes and you know, MPEG video stuff. Um, so if you have any interest in talking about cable stuff and geek out with me later, um, we can either do it uh, today or tomorrow. Um, so I, I guess where I wanted to start today was with a very simple type class. And the only two type classes we're going to look at today are semigroup and monoid. So if you're familiar with those, cool. Um, the reason I picked semigroup is that it was my first type class. Uh, many years ago, there was a Scalathon here in Philadelphia. Does anybody, anybody attend that? Yeah? A couple people? So I didn't, and I felt really bad about it. Um, and I was home that, I think it was a Saturday, and I was home that Saturday, and I saw everybody tweeting about what a great time they were having, and I went off and tried to learn Scala Z6. And I hit a wall pretty quickly, and I went and watched a video by Nick Partridge where he like sat at a REPL and derived semi-group and monoid and built up this type class library uh, in about a two-hour user group uh, meeting. And it really clicked for me. Um, between that and actually some blog posts from Eric when he was out at Vizia, I think, right, um, dealing with like some of the beginnings of Spire, um, uh, I ended up getting this deep appreciation for type classes and how we could organize code uh, this way in Scala. And so I picked semigroup to start today because it's pretty uninteresting from a language feature perspective, right? We're not using like higher kind of types. There's nothing really fancy going on here. Um, and instead, what I want to look at here is all the things that we're going to decorate it with, that we're going to obfuscate this definition with to make this usable in Scala. Um, so one of the first things I, I want to do to this type class is provide this implicit summoning method, right? I want to be able to write this um, syntax at the bottom of the screen here where we can say, give me a semigroup of int, right? Look up an implicit scope and find me some semigroup of int, and then let me call combine one, two on it. Um, and in order to make that syntax work, we've got to put like this little boilerplate apply method, right? That just summons this implicit value out of implicit scope and just returns it directly, right? So um, if you looked at uh, like Scala C7, for instance, every single type class has this apply method, right? Corresponding to, to the type class name. The next thing I want to do to this is add all of my OO syntax. Right, all of my syntax or ops or enrichment methods, you know, how, whatever you want to call it, um, but all of my infix notation for calling methods of my type class directly on values. And you know, part of the reason for doing this is to provide a more familiar experience to folks that are dealing with um, like regular O style uh, Scala. But another reason to do this is that we get much better type inference. Um, as we start summoning type classes directly based off of type, we have to build up some big gnarly types when we, we try to use those um, apply uh, summoners, and um, here we can sometimes, you know, get better inference if we have this, uh, this syntax enrichment. So, you know, here we're using like an implicit class. Um, it's not a value class, which you know I, I might get into a bit later. Um, but, but you know, the idea is that we're going to capture like the left-hand side value that we're invoking some operator on, and then um, sort of curry that into this ops class, if you will, and uh, you know, delegate through to our semigroup definition. Um, once we do that, everybody loves operator aliases, or at least the C++ programmers uh, do, as we learned earlier today, right? Um, so we can add like this bar plus bar operator alias, implement it the exact same way. Um, our Spark users, right? We have serializability, and uh, we, you know, we want to mix in our serializable trait. Most type class instances are vacuously serializable, right? Um, they have no state whatsoever, so as long as we have classes available in the class loaders, um, they can be serialized. Uh, we might also want to make our type classes universal traits. Maybe this is a little more controversial, um, but you know, at, at least there's no reason why we want to force people to uh, to not have universal traits, if that makes sense. Um, so if someone has some reason to implement a type class with uh, a value class or uh, mix a type class into some other universal trait, we don't want to prevent them from doing so. Right? Um, we get to some domain-specific things. We want to add concrete you know, helper methods, if you will, concrete definitions to our type class that are defined just in terms of the abstract operations of our type class. Right? So these two are, um, they come from, uh, you know, from Spire. Um, the definitions here don't really uh, matter exactly what they're doing. The point is we have concrete methods that are um, defined in terms of our abstract operations. 
and we want syntax for our concrete methods, right? In this particular case, we chose to only add syntax for combine n, and we did that by looking at the shape of the first argument of all of the concrete methods, right? Um, if we looked at combine all option, we see that the first argument is a traversable once of a. You know, we're not currently enriching type class methods onto traversable once as, although we certainly could. Um, but we are adding syntax to values of type a, so we should be able to call combine n, right? As a user of my type class, or of the type class, not, as opposed to an implementer, um, I don't care what methods are concrete versus which are like fundamental, right? So I want all of these um, syntax uh, in fixed notation methods. Um, we saw earlier, uh, you know, at least in CATS and, and in Scala Z7, we define relationships between type classes with subtype polymorphism, right? So here we say a monoid is a semigroup where we've got this empty operation and the empty, you know, behaves in a certain way with combine. Um, I, I, I totally punted on laws today, so uh, I'm not talking about, um, you know, how, to, how we can verify type class implementations. But um, the point here is that we're using subtype polymorphism to, to represent this relationship. There are other mechanisms, right? So Alois Couchard has um, a project called SCADO. Um, people are looking at it as the basis for Scala Z8's type class um, layout. Um, you know, with CATS, we actually experimented a little bit early on. Um, I think Julian had some ideas on, on how we could do that. Um, I still think that subtype polymorphism for type class hierarchies is the, it, it, for me, it strikes a nice balance between implicit resolution, workarounds, and performance. Um, that's not to say that's always gonna be that way, and whether Scala 2.11 or 2.12 or whatever, um, we might find that there are better encodings. But as of right now, I think, you know, subtype polymorphism is good uh, for this. Um, so if we start admitting subtype polymorphism, then we're gonna want all of the same functions, right? So I was actually tempted to like phrase this talk in the form of like, if you give a mouse a cookie, right? Um, because once we've done all of this, uh, you know, infix notation for semigroups, we're gonna want them for monoids. Um, we can reuse the stuff we've done so far. So here in the monoid companion object, we get all the same boilerplate, but we don't have to redefine the boilerplate for um, the semigroup operations. We can just extend like the, the semigroup ops class from, from the previous type class, right? And that admits a, a, a usage syntax that starts looking like this. Uh, we can import, import this monoid.ops uh, enrichment and we can write things like one bar plus bar two. But it also gives us things like this. And I think this is a very um, challenging thing for folks that are new to working with libraries like CATS, um, is that they import you know, two conflicting implicits. In this case, we're importing semigroup ops and monoid ops, and we get this completely unhelpful error message saying bar plus bar is not a member of int. And of course, what's happening here is that we have like both of the implicit conversions to the semigroup ops and monoid ops, they conflict with each other, they cancel out, and we get no help from the compiler. So my point in this intro to this talk is that organizing type classes into a library and making that library easy to use um, is difficult. There's a lot of different knobs to turn. And it's not always obvious that if you turn a knob here, it has rippling effects into something you didn't intend, right? And uh, you know, frankly, if we want to promote type classes and their adoption in Scala, we need some mechanism to manipulate this complexity or, or avoid this complexity. And so for that reason, we get to our first project today that addresses this infrastructure, and that's Simulacrum. Um, so Simulacrum is um, a project of mine. It's about a year old. It's a macro annotation-based code generator. That's all it is, is a code generator, right? It happens to generate code at compile time. It doesn't generate source files on disk, but it generates it, compiles it, and you get byte code, right? Um, and so everything we've done so far with Simulacrum looks like this. You'd import two annotations, and like, I know, I, I don't love annotations either, right? But you import two annotations, and you annotate your type classes with this at type class. Um, as a result of doing that, we get all of the boilerplate we've seen, all of the enrichments, all of the, like, the implicit summoning, the, the, the infix notation, everything's automatically generated. Um, and we get infix notation for every method that, you know, every method whose first argument matches the shape that the type class abstracts over. So here we would get infix notation for like combine and combine n, as well as is empty. Right? Um, we have this at op annotation, where if you annotate a method with at op bar plus bar, um, will additionally generate an alias for that, you know, an operator alias for that in the infix notation. If you said like alias equals false, you wouldn't get a combine infix method, you'd only get bar plus bar. So it's a bit of a preference, like do you want multiple options for your in infix notation or do you wanna, you know, fix people just to use operators. Um, so with those annotations, like I said, we get this uh, boilerplate around implicit summoners. We get the boilerplate around um, infix notation, the, the imports are a little bit different here, so we're importing semigroup.ops.underscore. 
Um, but, but other than that, um, you know, we, we can still support like a la carte imports on each individual type class. And we haven't really solved the problem with conflicting imports, so sorry. But um, we do have an option, and this is how we do it in cats, right? And the, the idea is that the type class um, library author can mix together all of these different auto-generated traits into a single bulk import object. And then users can just import that entire object. So like that has to be manually written, but the two semigroup ops and the two monoid ops are just generated by simulacrum, right? So there's like three lines of boilerplate for this. And if you look in cats, like if you say like import cats at implicit side underscore, there's a big object that has a bunch of that style uh, mix-ins uh, to enable that. Um, that avoids all those import conflicts, right? So one bar plus bar two ends up working out fine. Um, so simulacrum, it's, you know, I think there's this like law of working with macros that's like you feel really good when you start and you think you can solve all these problems and the more you work with macros, the less confidence you have in your solution, right? Um, and so simulacrum is implemented with macro paradise. It's a macro annotation. Um, right now it supports, uh, you know, working with type classes that abstract over proper types like semigroup and monoid, as well as unary type constructors like, you know, monad, applicative, um, functor. It does not support, you know, other exotic shapes, right? So we can't do um, binary type constructors. Um, there's some other, uh, you know, things we, we can't do related to, to the shape of the, the type class, um, type parameter. Um, I don't think there's any technical reason for that. It's just work, right? It's just difficult work. Um, and I, I expressed this, I said to Paul Phillips once that I was a little overwhelmed with trying to predict the amount of work that would be involved to make simulacrum support binary type constructors. And he said, you should be. Um, so that kind of gave me permission to ignore it. I don't know. Um, it's a local syntactic transform. This is important. Um, we don't type check anything, right? So the trees that are fed to simulacrum, we, we, we take this policy that we're not going to type check any of those trees. We have to work with what we're given. And as a result, um, there's some things that bleed out. Like the abstraction's not perfect, right? Um, so for example, we don't know, like if we look at um, monoid, and we say, okay, monoid extends semigroup, we can see that. We don't know if semigroup's actually a type class or it's just some random supertype. Um, and so there are things in the CATS code base you may see, like the apply type class has got this like weird exclude parents parameter to the, to the um, at type class annotation. There's sometimes where things bleed out is the point. Um, same thing with like this override keyword. There are places where override would be optional in Scala, but it's mandatory when you use simulacrum. Like we don't know if you're actually overriding a, a super type definition or if it's just completely abstract and super type. Um, simulacrum does have IDE support. So this is new as of this fall, but like it's, it's not the greatest form of IDE support. The only reason it has IDE support is because some awesome engineer at IDEA, right IntelliJ, went and re-implemented simulacrum in the IDE as a plugin, right? So like there is no like magic macro paradise support for um, IDEs. All right, I wanna talk about performance. This is the second big area I want to talk about today. Um, so let's look at one plus two and look at what happens, right? So to, you know, the first approximation I want to look at is um, let's just see what code's actually being generated here. And it looks, you know, pretty much like what you'd expect. We're calling this method to all semigroup ops on the ops object on the semigroup companion. Um, we're passing it two different parameters, the left-hand side one and some uh, instance of our semigroup type class, this SG int, which happens to be on the companion of semigroup. And then whatever comes back from that, we call bar plus bar two. This results in this mountain of bytecode, right? Um, and the first thing that jumped out to me, which and it probably jumped out to Eric, is all the boxing, right? So to fix, we can um, use specialization. And like this isn't to say we're doing anything super fancy with specialization and um, simulacrum, but rather that these things are orthogonal. And they're always like work to make this happen, right? Like simulacrum has to handle specialization, make sure you know, we basically move the type annotations correctly through all the type parameters. Um, and so anyway, if we do specialize on int here and run the same code, we get rid of all the boxing and unboxing. So we have less bytecode, right? And less bytecode's always better. Um, but we still have this call to two all semigroup ops. And really what's happening here is an object allocation. And so this kind of stinks, right? That like, in order to use this nice form of syntax, we have to allocate things at runtime. Um, you know, invoke methods on them and then rely on garbage collection and escape analysis to get them back off our heap. Uh, and, and to really adopt type classes, I think we need to address this directly uh, in, in the language infrastructure. So 
we have an op or we have a, a solution to this, right? Many people have probably seen Eric talk about this. Um, originally, we solved this, or Eric and Tom Switzer solved this in uh, Spire, and those macros that supported it got moved out into this project called Machinist. So if we rewrite our type class from scratch and we don't use simulacrum, uh, we go back to our original definition, we leave our specialization in, in the companion object for semigroup, group, we will manually write our ops class, right? And with that manual definition, rather than, like in, in order to implement our operators, rather than directly delegating to our type class, we will use a macro that's provided by machinist. So here you can see bar plus bar is implemented as macro, um, bin op, right, short for binary operator. And really that is coming from this object down below that provides this like lookup table that says if you're ever trying to map an operator, like an infix operator with the name on the left, then map it to a function on the type class with the name on the right, right? So it sees bar plus bar, maps to combine, and automatically the macro knows to inline effectively any calls to this type class directly to uh, calls on our, on our trait. And so if we look at the same execution when using machinist, we can see like this is basically as good as we're going to get. Um, the get static and the invoke virtual are just looking up our instance. right? They're just looking up our, our um, semi-group int instance, which happens to be in the companion object. We have two constant loads and, and a single invoke interface. right? So machinist really solves this problem of type class performance as it relates to infix notation. And I should point out, like, yeah, I could have done some of this with um, value classes, like made those implicit classes value classes, but it turns out like you trade off terrible things in other directions if you do that, so they end up just not panning out. Um, value classes are, are very specific to where you know where they can be used, and in, in large library code organization, it ends up uh, not being very useful. Right, so um, this is unfortunate. We have simulacrum, we have machinists, they don't quite integrate, right? Um, and I think forcing this choice is, is a bit false. Like we shouldn't be making people trade off boilerplate for performance. I think really to make type classes successful, we really need to solve this you know, at the root. Um, so I at least have two different options on how we can solve this. The first is like very shallow. Um, it's very easy, <laughs> another way to, to say that. And that's basically that um, we trade a little bit of boilerplate for performance. And um, the idea here is that if the person, if the type class author, uh, wants to just write the start of the ops trait. Like, don't worry about making an implicit class, don't worry about extending super types, don't worry about you know, specialization annotations and all that, but just give us a little skeleton of the ops trait. And then any method that should be optimized is manually optimized with a hook to machinist. Um, you know, simulacrum, when it kicks in, can just sort of like decorate this ops trait and build it up into like the real type that's gonna represent um, the operations. And so I think that's like really easy and it preserves modularity. So the, the point this morning about like we, we look at the type level stack and all of the different modules, um, it's nice like machinist and simulacrum are still complementary. Um, but like, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's still not ideal, right? I still don't wanna have to manually write all these skeletons for methods that should be fast. Um, it, it just opens this opportunity for like this ad hocness. Like, yeah, you know, bar plus bar is gonna be called a lot, but is empty is probably not gonna be called a lot, so it's okay for that one to be slow. Right, like, how can you make those type of global optimization decisions as a general purpose, low level library, right? So, I mean, clearly I think it's better to like, just magically make this all happen, um, but you know, I don't know how. Um, so tomorrow, let's work on that. Okay, my third area I wanna talk about is providing instances. Um, and so, you know, in order to talk about where we should put instances of type classes, we have to know where the compiler looks for instances, right? And we're gonna use implicit resolution to do this. Um, and so, the, the way I wanna discuss this today is that effectively the compiler's gonna look in two prioritized places. One is gonna look in lexical scope and the enclosing lexical scopes um, for either implicit vowels or defs that are, are, are either defined or imported in that scope. If it doesn't find what it's looking for there, the compiler will go search implicit scope. Okay, and at least as a close approximation, good enough for today, um, I'm gonna define implicit scope as saying, if I'm looking for an instance of a given type that's got a bunch of applied types in it, um, we can look at the, the, you know, basically every type that appears in my applied type and all of its super types, more or less. So if I'm looking for semigroup int, the compiler will look in the companion of semigroup, it'll look in the companion of int, if there is one, it'll look in the companion of every super type of semigroup and every super type of int, right? So immediately, like we have the simplest possible library here of semigroup and monoid and we have a problem, right? That if 
we, we, we don't control like the int companion, right? We can't stick instances into the int companion. And if we put like a monoid definition of, of uh, you know, or if we put the monoid of int in the monoid companion object, when we go to search for the semi-group instance, we're not gonna find it. So we could sort of play games and do all the boilerplate that we saw this morning when we were trying to do, give that by prod instance, right? We could have like a semi-group definition in the semi-group companion and then somehow try to reuse that with a class and, but now we're trading boilerplate again, right? And so we want some way to, to, um, to have a richer fidelity in what we can do uh, you know, with, with instance providing. Another thing that I want to be able to do when, I, when I'm providing instances is derive them. And we've seen a couple of uh, examples of this so far. But like if I have this simple product type of, of foo, you know, made up of two ints, and they're both, um, they, you know, we have, we have a semi-group for int, I should you know, automatically be able to have a semi-group for foo. Right? There's, no, there's no mechanism here. It's just pure, um, you know, pure uh, boilerplate in, in generating this instance. And so if you've seen Miles give talks on the, you know, shapeless space derivations, or you've seen me give talks on like the S codex usage of those derivations, you've seen Travis give talks on Cersei, you've probably seen slides like this, right? And like I'm not gonna go through this. You know, if you want to you know, learn about how shapeless space derivation works, those other talks are great. Um, but the idea here is that we're gonna define the way these instances work as a set of inductive rules. And we're gonna encode those inductive rules using implicits. And so the question is, where do these go? Right? Um, we could put them in the type class companion, right? If we do that, we have a shapeless dependency. And for some projects, this works great. S codec, my public API of S codec has shapeless all throughout it, right? Even though it's not in like the syntax of it, you don't necessarily see that you're using shapeless. It's, it's spread all throughout. Um, but for some projects, this doesn't work. Uh, Miles Benson just released shapeless 2.3, right? I have not released S codec core on shapeless 2.3 yet. So if anyone's trying to upgrade to like the latest version of Cersei auto derivation that uses 2.3, you're gonna have a problem, right? Um, and so for some projects, that type of lockstep dependency, at least on binary compatibility um, you know, breakage points, uh, becomes a problem. And so maybe instead, we just put all of those implicit derivations in a standalone object. But think what happens if we do that. If we import everything in that standalone object, we're importing them into lexical scope in some block. And now if we do that, we're gonna override instances that happen to be provided in implicit scope. The compiler's never gonna move on to implicit scope. It's always gonna use the derivation stuff first. Right? And so we have like this, this nasty problem that users should not have to think about in order to use our libraries. Um, so our third type level project that I wanna look at today is Export Hook. Um, it's Miles' project. Um, and the general idea of Export Hook, I'll, I'm gonna butcher this, Miles, I apologize in advance, but the general idea of Export Hook is that um, we're going to define this one low priority trait at the very bottom. And we're gonna annotate it with at imports, an annotation that comes from export hook. And we're gonna say we're gonna import instances of semigroup here. And it's like an extension point, if you will. Um, and then in our companion object for semigroup, we'll just extend our low priority trait, okay? So in, this is our jar, our library of type classes themselves, right? Now in a separate jar file, where it's okay to have a dependency on shapeless, right? Or some other derivation-based mechanism. Maybe you're using you know, custom macros the way like pretty print does from, from Li Hai. Um, but, but in some other place, we're gonna define these inductive rules in an object. And in this object, we're gonna annotate it with that exports. Okay? And then in our in a third location, when we go to use this thing. We're gonna import our infix notation, and then we're gonna import all of those derived exports. So this seems like it's gonna have the same problem, right? That we're bringing all of that stuff into a lexical scope. But through the magic of export hook, um, we're able to do the right thing in this case and, and still have the appropriate implicit priorities, right? So the, the derived stuff will only kick in if um, the right instances aren't found in the normal implicit scope. And in fact, uh, I don't think my, this was Miles' intention, but um, the net result is the current version of export hook has something like eight priority levels. And because, um, because when we were exporting our, our uh, implicit definitions, we didn't specify a priority level. I think it's at the default priority level. Yeah, good. Um, but we could have named the export level, right? We could have said that like our instances are at the algebraic level. Maybe that's the way, um, if we were using export hook to define like those by prod instances from this morning, we would have put them at the algebraic level. Um, 
You know, and there are other options here uh, as it relates to like generic defined instances. And in fact, we can even change these implicit priorities. So if for some reason this set of you know, eight levels doesn't quite work for your case, you can reorder them and define your own priority levels. Um, so I have two other very small projects I want to talk about today. Uh, the first is local implicits. Um, so local implicits has a single API. Uh, it's a method called imply. And what it does is lets you introduce values into lexical scope, implicit values, right? So if you just look at these four different expressions, um, here I'm making the assumption that my default uh, semigroup int instance is addition, but I've got three alternative instances, uh, one for multiplication, you know, minimum and maximum. And uh, imply takes two argument lists. The first is a var arg list of implicits that should be inserted into scope, and then it takes a, a specific lexical scope, um, evaluates that block in context with those, you know, with those implicits available. Um, this is a proof of concept only, and it's controversial, right? Because not everybody believes, well, some people believe in type class coherence. There should only be one instance for any given type class, for any given type. Um, you know, but I do want to point out that like other languages besides Haskell, there there are there is interest in these locally defined instances, and so something like this local implicits thing could help provide syntax to Scala that lets us explore some of the ideas that we're seeing um, in some of those other languages. Um, if you are interested in learning about uh, local type class instances um, or just in general avoiding like global um, coherence, um, this paper uh, is really good. The other really small project I want to look at is another one of Eric's. It's called Imp. Um, and Imp has two bits of API. Um, one is called uh, the Imp method, and it's, it's semantically equivalent to calling implicitly. All it does is rewrites calls to implicitly into just the, um, the, the, the looked up value, the compile time looked up value. So implicitly is not inlined, right? It seems kind of amazing that it's not inlined, right? But it's not inlined. Um, it is a bytecode invocation, right? And maybe Hotspot's going to you know, inline it if we call it enough, um, but why rely on Hotspot if we can just get rid of it at compile time, hence imp. Um, perhaps uh, you know, uh, an interesting point of integration, though, is using one layer down in the imp API, and that's the summon macro. And so for all those you know, implicit summoning methods we implemented previously, we could implement the, the, uh, the, the, the right-hand side of those um, summoning methods using the underlying summon macro from imp. And so as a net result of that is if you just wrote like semigroup of int, you'll just um, at, at compile time that'll get inline to be whatever reference the compiler you know, referenced. Um, so there's a very nice uh, performance benefit to uh, this, this uh, imp integration. Uh, so timeline wise, uh, I think I saw Tom and Eric right at Strange Loop in 2012 debut like Spire macros for performance. Right, um, quite a bit ago. And in early 2014, that stuff was pulled out and put into Machinist, and now we can all benefit. Um, Simulacrum just came out like last February or late January, and everything else has been in the last year. Right, so I think there's, the interesting thing here is that like the macro ecosystem, macro paradise, um, some compiler plugin work, like I think it's matured to the point that we're starting to learn like what we can do uh, with it, what types of things that we can solve. And maybe even some of the things that we thought could only be solved via type level Scala, um, we're finding that we can solve it directly in mainline Scala using these extension points, right? some of the things. If we break down what all these projects are addressing into different, like into this like classification scheme, we can say that Simulacrum really helps us define type classes, where Xput helps us provide instances. Right? Um, local implicits maybe helps like some weird definition of like use sites um, uh, usability. And we've got this like runtime performance improvement from Machinist and Imp. And so like if we put all of those things together, we end up with this project called Type Classic. And like don't go here, because if you go to this link, it's completely empty. There's this awesome README that Eric wrote, but that's it. That's only README. Um, but the general idea is that like we recognize there's this opportunity for integration, and we really want to take it to the next level and find like those natural integration points, the things like you know, where simulacrum machinist could be cooperating to, to generate all of the uh, infix notation, um, as well as maybe look at other uh, areas that should be pulled in and, and should be considered part of the overall infrastructure for addressing type class based design. And so for example, here's like a bunch of other things that we might want to consider pulling into something like type classic. Um, you know, in, in Scala Z and Cats, we have, you know, both projects have this unapply trick, 
right, to work around like higher order unification problems. Um, and if we have that uh, unapply trick somehow available in Type Classic itself, we could automatically generate things like traverse U and sequence U rather than sort of relying on people to manually kind of play the jigsaw you know, puzzle and put all these pieces together to make it compile. Um, you know, Shapeless has got some stuff to work around. Scala C, um, implicit search uh, bailing out early when deriving instances. Um, we've got other stuff in Shapeless via cached implicit to do, um, you know, to help you know, compile time performance issues as, as it relates to um, deriving like big instances. And so maybe we could categorize those into this same taxonomy, right? And look at like how each of these, if they were part of this overall type classic umbrella, maybe like what type of uh, integrations um, could we could we support? Um, IDE support, right? Like the fact that Simulacrum happens to be supported in IntelliJ, that's awesome. But is there something else that we could do? Um, Sam Halliday's got a project that's just getting started. It's called Imaginary, where I think through his work in Enzyme, he's looking for ways to like, you know, get Enzyme to better understand what's happening with some macro invocations, right? And like while it's probably too early to say that like imaginary might solve like macro annotation and paradise stuff, um, I think it's interesting that we're starting to work on like next generation tooling around language infrastructure. And so um, just to wrap up, there's one other point I have about type classic, and that's that um, we have like at least these three different usage modes defined. Um, we have this like first mode where whatever, like type classic or, um, or whatever language infrastructure we have is only applied at compile time of the library that contains your type classes. That's how Simulacrum works today, right? Once you've done that compilation, Simulacrum's gone. It doesn't even exist. Um, we have a, a more sophisticated mode where you need something at compile time at the use site, too. So like machinist and imp and local implicits, they all kind of fit into this case, right, where like, Someone writes in their code, like, give me the semigroup for a list of ints, and um, we need to like, rewrite that with a macro that's available at compile time into uh, something a little more optimized. And then finally, like mode three, we extend mode two with like a runtime component, some jar that's on the runtime class path. So like that unapply trick, right? For unapply, we need something on the runtime class path because that needs to be linked and, you know, and addressed at, at runtime. So the interesting thing about these modes is that like different library authors that we've talked to want different modes. Right? And it's not clear to me with type classic that like should we kind of you know, go for broke and try to implement all three modes and like let people pick what they want and then turn on and off features, or do we say that like no, we get a better experience if we only support three? Or no, we're okay, we're gonna give up features and only support one, right? Um, I don't know, um, that's, that's something I wanna talk about uh, this week. Um, so just in you know, my final parting thoughts, um, we looked at three big pieces of language infrastructure today and then two little ones. Um, you know, I, 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 the, the main point today is that um, in order to make type classes uh, adoptable by the, the larger audience of Scala developers, I really think we need to start looking at things like you know, how they perform, um, how to deal with like, the implicit prioritization problems that, that we have today. And um, hopefully type classic is a place where we can kind of melt these ideas together and see what comes as a result. So anyway, that's all I have for today. This is all really awesome. Um, I, I just just to add to the list of, of possibilities, um, since one of my obsessions is uh, documentation, another thing that this could start to allow is um, a Scala doc like thing that is type class aware, right? Because we know now this isn't a normal trait, right? This is a type class. We know these are the operations provided. We know this is the syntax. We can say these are some things we know about how the instances are being derived. So um, some kind of doc tool integration, I think, is a would be a really helpful thing to add to the list. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think there's something related there too. As you get to laws testing, I think it's a little more challenging because you're pulling in like frameworks and stuff. But I think. Like on methods of, or on type classes themselves, you could do something SPT doc test style or tut style where you actually like put the laws somehow encoded in the, in the definition of the type class itself. But yeah, so it's a little bit different, but, but I think both areas are, are, are pretty interesting. Uh, so I know f uh, for Simon Lackney, you said you weren't going to do like the whole binary type constructing and other shapes thing. I was wondering, uh, is that going to be the same case for type classic, or is it sort of like an up and error question? or? Yeah, so I wouldn't say I'm not going to do it. Um, I would I would love to pair with someone on it, uh, 
It's more that, like, since Paul thought it's hard, it's clearly going to be impossible for me, right? Um, no, I mean, I, th I, think it's, I think it's doable, but uh, when you start doing that, you either basically have to break out, like, uh, all these weird permutations of the um, quasi-quote definitions internally, or you have to completely go away from quasi-quotes and write everything against, like, just the, the API of, of, of the Scala compiler. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but, but, yeah, I think at the very least, extending it to just binary type constructors would get us like from 90% of cases to like 99% of cases, um, even if it's not like arbitrary shapes. So I, I do still want to do that. And, and by the way, there's a bunch of other opportunities in Simulacrum. Um, like some projects really like to have the type class methods defined directly on the companion object. So I think Spire used to do that, but um, I'm not sure if it still does. Algebra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's some other opportunities too, or like based off of like user preference, you know, maybe we can mix in some other syntax options. Do you know if anyone's benchmarked the overhead of the of the allocation for infix operators? Because I wonder how much of that hotspot actually, wait, you know, fixes for you in escape analysis and stuff. So I wonder if it's yeah. a big problem or if it's like a theoretical. Yeah. So, so I do know. I mean, I've benchmarked it from a from, you know, like profiling apps at work, and I can say in my type of application, it's never been an issue. However, if you're doing heavy duty numerical stuff like tight loops, then Eric has done a bunch of benchmarking, um, in, in these areas, and it does show you know market improvement. So, and I think you've got some some talks on that, right? Yeah, I would, I would, I would say that. We have benchmarks in Spire that we run periodically to test. All right. Uh, we have benchmarks in Spire that we run to test that our specialization is working properly, where we compare like a direct implementation, a boxed, and then a specialized generic. And uh, yeah, I mean, you definitely see a huge difference with like int, long, double, float, these types. Um, with with objects, I think it's much less. But um, so there's there's both the boxing, but then the operators do you also you also do see that cost as well. Um, it, it can kind of vary. It, it sort of basically it just depends on the unit of work that your type class does. Like if your type class does a lot of work per invocation, then yeah, it's not a big deal. But if it's like plus or like a com like a greater than or compare or something, which have like JVM you know intrinsics behind them, you really do notice the cost. Um, also, the other thing that you see is increased. The more bytecode you have, you you push yourself above the 35 byte inlining limit. So that's actually probably the bigger issue is that. Uh, you just like things are fine until suddenly they're not. Basically, depending on how many bytes of bytecode you happen to have. I think what you're doing is really interesting, extending the uh, Scala language effectively with new constructs. Do you think the future of the evolution of Scala should be in people basically going hog wild with macros? And, So I'm going to guess that Miles has a thought on this. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll defer to Miles. Um, we, we're going to have an unconference session on that tomorrow. <laughs> I think, I think, I think the, 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 the answer is, I think, basically, the hiatus with um, type level Scala, because we were all basically all far too preoccupied with, with cats uh, this year, has meant that, that because there's really been no progress or very little progress on that, we, we've been kind of forced to explore other options. And it's actually turned out that some of the other options uh, are really you know, not quite palatable. Um, and there's definitely an upside in as much as I, I think for most people, um, um, you know, actually making, using, using a library which, which contains some admittedly somewhat hairy and scary macros is actually a much, much safer proposition from a, you know, deploy, you know, putting into production kind of point of view than, than, than actually working off a, a forked Scala compiler from some bunch of ne'er-do-well functional programmers. Um, uh, so, <laughs> so, I, so I think, so I think from a, from a, I think, I think to the extent that it's possible um, to, to do things without too many compromises. I think, I think, I think trying to, trying to, to move some of the language extensions into, into macros, I think actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I've also done a, a few little experiments just recently, which actually suggest that, that we might be able to do almost everything as a compiler plugin. Um, so uh, rather than a fork compiler, which I, th I think also opens up a bunch of other pro possibilities. But I think we should talk about that at length tomorrow. No more questions? All right, then let's thanks Michael again. Thank you. Thank you.